Hi, everyone. So, uh, I'm Vinay Gupta of the Hex Hero Project. So, today, we're going to be talking about nanotechnology in the forms that we typically encounter it, which is nanomaterials rather than sort of replicator engineering. Um, so, let's have a think about what happens. <clears throat> There's a saying that technology is anything invented. Uh, after the time you return, the technology is anything invented after the time you turn 40. And I certainly feel that way. The rate of change in things that I've been around my entire life is completely unprecedented. I hardly know what to do this. So, um, I'm going to start with something that's very, very simple and then work up to a story about how the future is going to work for all of us, but particularly for the poor. This is the first airplane, literally the first uh, powered flying device that's heavier than air. And from there, there were a series of incremental changes over the course of about a century that took us to here. That's the SpaceX reusable rocket. And we went up that path really without anybody noticing. There were lots of little incremental improvements, and then you'd occasionally get breakthrough like Concord. There were spikes like First Man on the Moon. But the real story here is that this used to require full resources and superpower of war, and now it was done off the back of a dot-com business. So it went from requiring the full resources of the US empire at its peak to being done basically by a bunch of rich guys who wanted to give a shot. And that transformation happened by degrees. Think about the iPhone. The iPhone has been around for seven years, and we sort of take it for granted that this is what phones are like now. But actually, that's a completely new phenomenon. We've never seen that before. Uh, it came from nowhere. It's going, we don't know where. And it came over the last seven years. We've, we've no conception of that. When did the phone become something? I mean, you know, when I was a kid, phones stuff like wires. Right? Then they became wireless, then they became computers, then they became pocket supercomputers. And it just slides up this curve that everybody calls the phones so nobody notices it. And this is what's happened with nanotechnology. Nanomaterials have snuck in everywhere. We weren't paying attention to it. Oops. So, think of this thing warm and dry. This is a jacket made up of some kind of gore tex stuff. Um, the basic material was invented to replace wool and fur. Wool, wool and fur were the height of organic evolution for managing being cold and wet. And they're incredible. They don't have much flexibility. Uh, dogs, for example, their woolen coat in winter all falls out in summer. So if they fly from a warm place to a cold place, they get frozen. And there's nothing they can do about it. So we needed more flexibility, we needed more adaptability, and we didn't grow fur. So you know, we've constantly had this challenge of trying to figure out how to do the warm and dry thing. Enter Gore-Tex. So this was taken with an electron microscope, and it's basically um, uh, Teflon, more or less, PTFE. And you stretch it very suddenly, and it forms this kind of sparse matrix. And these holes are so tiny that water can't come through them. So if you have water for a fine mesh, the surface tension of the water stops it coming through. And as a result, um, you wind up with uh, no water on the right side, which is what you want for the vertex. Um, so the other property is that if there's no water here, these holes are big enough that air can pass through, water vapor can pass through. And as a result, you get this. All of this material here is breathing so that you stay cool, uh, but the water won't come through it. And that's a completely new thing. Right? Nature doesn't have that capability. Nature solves this problem with oil and thick layers. So the outer layers get damp and they swell and they form a sign of some sort of protection. This is a complete break. It's like the fuel for staying warm and dry. Yeah. You could go outside, in your gear, if it rains, you don't have to care. You're going to stay warm, you're going to stay dry. It's amazing. Um, the trick of this stuff is that over 40 years, it's gone from being kind of expensive and a bit esoteric to being completely ubiquitous. It's just everywhere. And that transition uh, really happened by a series of tiny improvements. And you don't really notice it until suddenly, you know, one of these days, you're going to start seeing pictures of refugees in Cortex jackets. And everybody's going to turn around and go, like, when did that happen? Well, you know, you go down to your local Walmart or your, your Target and you can see kind of Gore-Tex knockoffs for about 20 quid a piece. 
it doesn't need to drop much further before suddenly everybody has access to it, just like happened with the cell phone. There's a progression down a curve as the technology makes its way out so that everybody can use it. Now, um, is Gore-Tex nanotechnology? Well, it's certainly a material with a nanostructure that does useful work, but it's not kind of the Eric Drex or self applicating machine kind of nanotechnology. It's a nanomaterial. The nanostale structure is extremely important, but it's not like little replicator robots made out of DNA that are doing jobs for us yet. Um, but it is an example of how control of materials at the atomic level can produce breakthroughs in ways that we would never have expected before they happen. Um, this is kind of the peak of the Gore-Tex experiment. You go into completely unmanageable places, and human beings with their you know, thin layers, this and that, the next thing, are completely functional in climates and killed us completely 200 years ago. And this stuff is amazing. Now, let's go back one. What are these ropes? You think, oh, you know, you spin it out of the wool, canvas, cotton, whatever it happens to be, you stretch it too far, it breaks. So this is a material called spectra. And uh, it's not the big yellow rope that you can see on the end that I'm using for handles. It's this very, very thin string. Now, I have some of it here on a roll. So uh, I'm going to basically roll some of this out. And then I don't know if you could pass it around the audience so everybody gets a chance to take a look at it. Just yeah, to catch. Now, can I have some volunteers to do a brake test for this? We're going to need six or so people, maybe ten. Come on down. Yeah, come on. Right, yeah, that's what we take. Right, get, get your hands on the handles. All right, we'll take a few adults as well. We've got a couple of burly guys. Come give it a hand. Yeah. Oh, sorry. All right. Oh, great. So it's going to be adults versus kids. Fantastic. Uh, you might need another adult. <laughs> you need some help there. All right. Come on, get all there. Grab your handles. Right? Now, do you see how thin the string is there? Right? There's really not very much to it, is there? Right. So, pull as hard as you can. Yeah, no, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Do, you, do you want to try and get some more people in there to help? Maybe? Right. Yeah. Does it even feel like it's stretching at all? No. 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 Funny, that, isn't it? You know what's really amazing about that stuff? Sorry. It's about 25p a meter. It's dirt cheap. Yeah, have a look at it. Spectrum. So what makes this material what it is, is nothing fancy at all. Carbon atoms. It's a chain of carbon atoms in very, very fancy fibers, all connected together. And they're wrapped in hydrogen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right? Make sure you got a look at the string. It's amazing. It is amazing. Great stuff. Right. So again, it's kind of an animal theory, right? Carbon atom to carbon atom, carbon atom to carbon atom in long chains, wrap the entire thing in hydrogen, line them up so they're more or less kind of sort of pointed in the same direction in the fiber, uh, and then let the fiber set. This is actually uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, right? Polyethylene, it's polythene. It's made of the same stuff you make your polythene bags out of. But you get the molecular structure right, and you make that chain 20, 30, 40,000 carbon atoms long, all of a sudden it begins to behave in this completely improbable way. That's got 300 kilogram breaking strength. It's completely ridiculous. You could hang like you know, five people in a hammock off that, it wouldn't break. Um, now, right? Incredibly strong. Well, we've seen that. Dirt cheap. Way cheaper than the equivalent of steel cable. It's amazing. Um, it's not ideal for everything. There are a few things that you know, if you hang a heavy weight off it, it will eventually break, which is a little inconvenient. Um, now, right? This is really the funny part. When did string become this way? When did string go from being this kind of fairly easy to work with, lightweight material that you use for this and that, the next thing, to being this completely impossible, unbreakable thing? Right? It just sort of happened. Invisibly, it comes up that curve. If you're 10 years old, you know, this is kind of sort of what string will be like everywhere by the time you're 20. You'll just think that string. All of us old farts will be looking at this like, when the heck did that happen? You're pulling an entire car off a hair. Right. And it just creeps up on you invisibly, and then suddenly everything changes. Right. I'm going to pass it to you. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I forgot the rest of it. I forgot some of my stuff. Right, so this is a cup, 
made of much the same stuff, and you kind of fold it together, and you could probably, can you manage to fold and unfold and then pass it back? It's made by a friend of mine called Jay Cousins. Orikasu, you fold it like this, and it's made of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, which is to say, really long carbon chains, but this time, instead of being a string, they're being plastic. Which means I can find a tea bag, I can have some tea. And that doesn't seem to be kind of in the right way. How am I doing for time? Hmm? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five Just enough time for time. I wasn't expecting this to boil this water quite as fast, I can't surprise. There. So, this stove is another one of these wondrous things. Um, so, it's called a biolite, and it's got about half a dozen really fundamental breakthroughs. I've been working with stoves of this general pattern for about 20 years. And this is the first one that I use, and every time I use it, this is what happens. So it's got a battery inside of it, and it's got a fan that's driven by the battery, and it's got this double wall steel wall. So the heat comes all the way, uh, the air rather, goes all the way around between the two steel walls, and it's incredibly hot. But it comes out into contact with the wood and burns. And it's got a piezoelectric, not piezoelectric, a uh, LTA junction in it, which is a little piece of a chip that generates an enormous amount of electricity from heat. And they're not very efficient, they're, not, they're kind of expensive, but it means that once the stove is running, it runs the fan on its own heat. So you could just take that stove outside and you could run it for 10 years and the batteries will never run out because it's constantly recharged. And it generates enough extra power that you could run a USB light off it, or you could charge a phone. And that's the first one of these stoves you can charge a phone off. There's been about five or six generations of Phillips to crack in it. And as you can see at the beginning, you know, I was running that with a handful of twigs and a bit of cardboard, and within a minute, minute and a half, you wind up with a foot long jet of flame coming out the side of your stove. Ridiculously overpowered, it's about five kilowatts. The people making this are not just aiming at us camping and hiking and this kind of stuff, they're looking at distributing that stove uh, in a simplified, cheaper form all over the world. Right? And when I say all over the world, they're talking about getting these things down to 10, 20, 30 dollars a unit. And you take that stove and a solar light and a Mozilla phone that you can charge off the stove, an incredibly cheap phone that's made open source. I won't talk about it too much today, but you know, that's 25 dollars and it looks pretty much like a standard phone. Um, you know, web browser and all the rest of that. And what you begin to see, you know, the, the LED lights and the little solar panels and all the rest of it, what you begin to see is that there's a pattern and if you put all of those pieces together, you get very high quality of life from very old material stuff. It's very durable, lasts a long time, it gets your water, your sanitation, uh, your, your cooking, your heating, your internet access. There are similar tools for various kinds of agricultural stuff. And you get this possibility of an incredibly high quality of life for really fairly poor people off the back of technology, most of which started out in the camping and hiking business. It, you know, it comes off this very, very, very long, slow chain of development for extreme outdoor stuff. And then the prices drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And then suddenly your villagers are living inside these little nanotechnology bubbles in which everything works great and they don't need a national grid, they don't need a huge power and water company. They have more or less total political freedom because everything that they need to survive at a perfectly happy level will fit inside the backpack. And it will all last forever. Um, so that's my story. Very much. The final thing I'll talk about very briefly is this thing called Hexer. So, are you okay for a minute? Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So, Hexer is a very simple structure. The wall is 1.2 meters by 2.4, and the roof pieces are half of 1.2 by 2.4. So, take the triangle. By taking a rectangle like this, cut it in half, put two pieces together, and make your triangles. And from that standard shape, you can make little ones like this, which are good for one family, and all the way up to big ones like this, which are good enough for school. 45 square meters, or 450 square feet. 
And for making these uh, the materials that I'm suggesting, is that you work in cardboard, big, thick industrial cardboard, an inch, maybe two inches thick, uh, sometimes it's got kind of a honeycomb structure, and you wrap it in the material that you see outside quite often in the woods, or lying in gutters, which never corrodes, never degrades, never rusts, which is the aluminium that we cover coke cans in, which is an incredibly high-spec, multi-lacquer, laminated aluminium product, and it costs about 50p a square metre. So you wrap your industrial cardboard in that stuff to protect them and to reflect off the sun, and then you can go out and make these buildings. And this is not, by the way, an architectural rendering. This is a, a temporary city in America called Burning Man, which is kind of like a recreational refugee camp. And they build about a thousand of these things or more every year. People download the plans from the internet and build them. So my vision of the future is that everywhere that people need a house, you go out there with a bunch of cardboard and coke can metal, fold it together in a really clever way, and you get houses that last until the coke can degrades, which could be decades or centuries and then you equip them with all of this kind of equipment, and what you get is a really high quality of life on practically no environmental footprint, um, with real durability for the things that you're using. And I think that we can do that for billions of people, radically improving their conditions, without having them to do things like leave their villages, move to the cities, and go through all the kind of social disruption that goes with that. Because this kind of equipment, that kind of house, and a decent computer, uh, this is a lifestyle that I think almost anybody can love. That's it. Thank you. K-A-S-O, Orecaso. Uh, my friend Jay started a company to sell them and they were so good and they lasted so long that eventually everybody that had, had wanted one had one. So uh, now they've become quite cheap on Amazon. After we buy them all up, they're actually ideal to make in a hacker space um, because you could buy this sheet material pretty cheaply and then you score it with a screwdriver uh, and you get cut directly to your order. Yeah, and if you wanted one that was about 200 mil for your coffin, for example, you can make it. <laughs> well, I mean, it is an object that really does look good in a kind of hacker context, but you imagine this beside your fine china teapot and it doesn't go silly. Uh, if you don't happen to like this kind of you know, stainless steel and weird, or weird primary color plastic aesthetic, uh, maybe the future is going to be a little difficult. Is the material recyclable or how? Yes. So HDPE, that is, you know, it's long chain polyethylene. You can basically melt it down and reuse it. Uh, in the form of the road, if you melt it down, it loses most of its strength and you put it back together again. So you could downcycle from the rope into the cup. But the cups, you could recycle and recycle and recycle and recycle because you just melt it and then turn it back into sheet and then cut the sheet to your shapes. It's the only plastic that Greenpeace endorses. Really? Yeah. The only plastic that Greenpeace endorses, so apparently it's the good plastic. Jay worked really hard with the plastic. Set? Yep. Okay, thank you all. So please, big round of applause to everybody.